Um, so here's a basic look at the hardware for at least a cartoon sketchup of the hardware on a time domain thermoreflectance system. Um, let me see if I can get a laser pointer here. Alright, that should work a little bit. Um, okay, so in general the way it works is that, you know, first the, uh, the laser system generates laser pulses. Um, the most typical way to do that is to have some kind of pump laser. Um, so this can be an ND YAG laser or I don't know, something else. It, but whatever kind of laser it is, it usually generates um, green, we're usually talking about green light um, continuously. So the first laser that's marked here, the ND um, YVO, um, generates a continuous green laser. Now, I said that what we needed was a pulse laser. And so what happens is this green continuous laser feeds into what's called a titanium sapphire oscillator. Um, I think the physics of these things are really not that important to understand, but these are usually like um, off the shelf items where they're at the heart of the system is a titanium dope sapphire crystal that fluoresces red. So like if you hit it with a green laser, it will fluoresce red. And um, if you bounce it back and forth between a series of, you know, intelligently chosen mirrors and lenses, um, it will, due to some nonlinear process, it, those continuous red fluorescent beams will actually divide themselves into lasers um, and, be, and turn into pulses. So what, when the continuous beam starts pulsing, that's called mode locking and a titanium sapphire um, oscillator will generate what's called mode locked um, pulses. Let's see if I can say a little bit more about that. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these lasers as we go, but, but essentially this titanium dope sapphire oscillator will generate a series of pulses. Um, um, generally, the very first thing you'll do once the laser comes out is you'll want to reduce the laser power because usually the laser power is a little higher than you want it. Um, and so, um, Generally at the output of this, there'll be an optical isolator. So this is a Faraday, um, a Faraday isolator. Um, sometimes people will put a half wave plate in front of that um, in, because a Faraday isolator typically has a, um, a polarizing beam splitter in it. So you can use this as a power selector. Um, if you don't understand why that is possible, then um, I would refer you to the um, preliminary videos I made on the, what happens when you have a combination half wave plate um, polarizing beam splitter or a half wave plate Faraday isolator. Um, that's contained in a other video. Um, okay, so, so the very first thing that the laser encounters is this optical isolator, which prevents any of the future laser beam from going back into the titanium sapphire laser. That basically just maintains the stability of the mode lock. Okay, so if I keep following this, um, so I follow this laser path, it bounces off a couple of mirrors in this drawing. Um, the mirrors aren't so important because the mirrors could be different on different systems. But, you know, as we're moving down, the laser um, comes upon another series of optics. This is typically where you would divide the pulses into a pump beam. Um, so in, in this drawing, the pump beam is going to go through the electric optic modulator. So it makes a right hand turn or sorry, a left hand turn um, and a probe beam, which also which moves forward toward the sample. Um, so, oops. So in this in this setup, we're dividing the pulses from the laser into a pump pulse and a probe pulse. Then we're going to modulate the pump beam, and in, in this system, we're going to modulate the pump beam. You can um, usually the pump beam is modulated. Um, this is an electro optic modulator. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how that works. Um, the um, the pump beam after it goes through the electro optic modulator, which basically turns the pump beam on and off at high speed. So now you've got a pump beam that's basically blinking on and off. Um, then we're going to advance the laser beam through a um, through the through a delay stage or in this case um, because this is the pump beam what we're going to do is we're going to advance the arrival time of the pump beam 
that is roughly equivalent to delaying the arrival time of the probe beam. It really doesn't matter which one you do. Um, so in this, in this case, we're going to advance the arrival of the pump beam by taking a mechanical delay stage and moving it upwards. After doing that for a while, we're going to recombine the pump and the probe beam um, using a set of, pull, of, of beam splitters. And then we're going to focus the pump and the probe beam onto a sample. Um, so that we're going to take that free space laser beam, which typically has you know a size of one millimeter kind of diameter, um, and we're going to focus down to something that has like micron, tens of or tens of micron size diameter. Um, after the beams um, hit the sample, we're going to bounce them off the sample, and we're going to send them towards a detector. Now um, our goal is to catch only the probe beam when we do this. So the probe beam was split off here from our polarizing beam uh, beam splitter. So in this diagram it goes around a series of mirrors and beam splitters until it hits the sample and bounces back off and back to a, a photodiode. So our goal is to basically catch that reflected probe beam on a photodiode at the very end of the system. And lastly, um, we also, so our goal was to collect the probe beam. Um, we do not want to collect the pump beam. Um, and so we're going to use a combination of essentially everything we can throw at it to get rid of the pump beam and make sure it does not make it back to the photodiode. Um, so that means we're going to use polarization. Um, so we're going to use the fact that the pump and the probe beam have different polarizations to filter the, the, uh, the pump beam when it comes back. We're also going to, so the word two tint comes from the fact that there's often a series of optical filters that actually make very slight, like razor's edge types cuts to the, to the spectrum of the, two, of the pump and the probe beam. And we will then, you know, right before the photodiode, remove um, any pump beam based on its wavelength. Um, and then there's a, another mechanism called a mechanical chopper that will also be useful for removing any um, pump beam that should make it back to the photodiode. Um, I'll talk about why it's so important to remove that pump beam later, but um, for the moment, suffice it to say that um, it has to do with the electro-optic modulator. Okay, why is this modulator here? Well, again, we'll have to get to that because it's a quite a detailed thing. Um, but uh, basically, the short answer is that we're going to turn the pump laser on and off at a known frequency. So we're like the whole the whole purpose is that by turning the the pump beam on and off at a known frequency, we'll be able to use what's called a, a lock-in amplifier to um, not just look for you know changes in reflectivity of our probe beam, but look for changes in the reflectivity of our probe beam at a particular frequency um, that we introduced. So that's going to allow us to use what's called a lock-in amplifier and get very, very high signal-to-noise um, ratio, even though the changes in reflectivity are small. I'll explain all that in due time, um, but for the moment, suffice it to say that it's important to um, collect the probe beam but reject every all of the pump beam from getting to this photodiode. Okay, so um, now I'm going to go through all the components of that system line by line and talk about what all this stuff is.